Hello and welcome, fight fans, to episode number 213 of the Neutral Corner Boxing Podcast. I am your host, Michael Montero, and today we're going to talk about the coronavirus KOing boxing. Really, all sports. It's going to be a bleak couple of months here, guys. So, we're going to have to find some stuff to talk about. A bunch of you are fighting over toilet paper in uh, your local Walmart. Those seem to be the best fights out there available for everybody right now. These toilet paper fights at the grocery. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to have a special guest on, Gail Falkenthal, who is a boxing writer and a public relations consultant. Uh, she's worked in the boxing industry for decades. Really, really knows her stuff, and she's out there in San Diego. So we'll talk about uh, the corona situation, obviously, but also media relations in boxing. I I feel that a lot of promoters just get this stuff wrong, and I don't know why. I don't know why more promoters, more fighters don't utilize PR people that know what they're doing to get their branding out there. And then we'll talk some women's boxing as well. As always, guys, we remind you, please drop a rating on uh, everything. Everything. Not just here on YouTube. Follow and everything else. Uh, Subscribe. But on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and all of the above. That helps me out tremendously. I can't tell you how much that helps me out. We are an independent operation here, so we depend on that. And even though we are all quarantined right now, basically, and everyone's wearing masks and afraid to get too close to each other, and all these boxing events are canceled, here I am giving you TNC live on a Monday. That's how much I love you guys. So uh, let's see. You know, let me give a quick public service announcement on this whole coronavirus thing. Because I tweeted this weekend that Tiffany and I went out to grab some dinner Saturday night. And I found it just really, really odd. It it just kind of eerie that when we went out, there was nobody at this restaurant. And, And let me make it clear. This wasn't some huge restaurant that seats 500 people. It's a little family corner restaurant in a strip mall hole-in-the-wall kind of place. All the other businesses in there pretty much close at 5 p.m. And there's a couple of restaurants that stay open late, obviously. But most of this strip mall closes after business hours. It's one of those types. But this little restaurant, it's an Indian joint, family-owned place. And usually on a Saturday night, it's packed because it's really, really good. The family's from India. They know how to... I love uh, those spices. I love spicy food. Anyway, we go there Saturday night. No one's there. No one. It was the manager, uh, one waitress, and the cook, and Tiffany and I. So there was five of us in this place. While we were there, we probably only were there for 30 minutes. We always ordered the same thing. We go right in, eat, leave, whatever. But it was just eerie seeing this place. where It probably seats 70, 80 people. And generally speaking, whenever we go in there, there's a wait. That's how good it is, right? A couple people came in to carry out food. That was it. So I tweeted about that. I, you know, I was thinking, you can't live your life in fear. Now, of course, I took a bunch of criticism because, hey, this is 2020 and everything has to get political. And a bunch of people accused me of uh, trying to make light of the coronavirus situation. Let me be clear about something. Um, I, look, guys, this is a big deal. The coronavirus thing is a big deal. All right. And... You have to be cautious and smart about what you're doing. That being said, there's a lot of you out there that watching this, listening to this, that depend on uh, maybe an hourly wage to feed yourself. Maybe you work for yourself. I know some of you guys who watch are in the landscaping business. You're into carpentry. So if you don't go out and work, you don't make money. You can't simply just stay at home. I know a bunch of you have kids where you can't just stay at home with your kids if they're home from school because, again, you have to go out and get paid so you can feed your kids. So I think there's a lot of hysteria right now and people saying, if you leave your house, you're a horrible person. Look, I think you can leave your house to get some food to feed your kids. I think it's not the worst thing in the world if you're a family, maybe you got three, four kids, and you can't just cook a steak every night, maybe you got to run up to, I don't know, Pizza Hut or whatever it is and grab a pie. 
so your kids can eat some food and it's fairly affordable, especially right now when you have limited work. Some of you guys depend on tips. You work in the service industry and you can't work right now. So everyone's situation is different. And I feel it's unfair that coastal elitist scumbags, who I've been accused of being myself before at different times, are lecturing people to not go out and leave the house. And if you do, you're a horrible piece of shit. Meanwhile, they're spending three hours in line at Costco where there's 500 people fist fighting with elderly folks over the last roll of toilet paper. That's generally how these things go. Look, the truth always lies somewhere in the middle, right? So let's see here. Um, Gail should be on in a couple of minutes here. Uh, Gail, I see that you're in the chat. Is this you that's called in already? Because I see a number on here. 447. I don't think that's you, Gail. I think you're a 619. That's your area code. Go ahead and call in now, Gail, if you're available, or else I'll keep ranting for a few minutes. Whoever's on the line right now, I don't think that's Gail. Uh, call back in a few minutes, bro. We're going to have Gail on, and then we're going to open up the phone lines to the rest of you guys in a little while, okay? So uh, that's the deal with that. Yeah, man. So, coronavirus, guys, it's a big deal, okay? Be smart. If you don't have to go out, don't go to the club right now. Don't throw a big party at your house. Social distancing doesn't just mean you have a bunch of people uh, in your house. All right, Aaron, I saw that was you on the line. Call back in, in about 20 minutes or so, brother, okay? Let me have Gail on, and then we'll chat. Guys, get in the, on the phones in about 20 minutes because there's really not a whole lot going on news-wise that we can talk about. So anything is, uh, or I should say, nothing is out of bounds. Anything you guys want to talk about, let's do it. I guess I could talk while we're waiting for Gail here to get on the line beyond my coronavirus public service announcement. Uh, some canceled shows, and you guys already know about this stuff probably. Of course, last weekend, Top Rank and PBC uh, canceled their shows. They had shows in uh, Maryland and New York. Those were canceled. Michael Conlon was going to do his annual St. Patty's Day fight in New York. That's been canceled. Pro Gray Hooker has been postponed. A lot of events postponed. California has ceased all fights for March. And Nevada is, as they've ceased everything in the commission until their commission meeting March 25th. They might come out of that meeting and decide, hey, we're canceling everything through April. And, of course, that will have significant repercussions. MGM Resorts has closed all their facilities until or further notice. It's just for an undetermined amount of time. So, of course, that's going to have a big effect. Uh, Brady's Dorticos has been pushed back from March 21st. We were supposed to get that this week. This episode was supposed to be the preview episode for that show. That's going to be on May 16th now. The next big fight I can think of that's still on the schedule right now is Inoue Casimero. But I just talked about MGM, everything being closed. So that fight now is probably going to go to like an empty studio. I think they want to go forward with it. I think the fighters are in transit or they might already be here in America by now. But that's probably going to be in an empty studio. Which I do think we're probably going to see several shows like that. Because, uh, look, the guy's got to fight. And although the promoters depend on those ticket sales to make money, uh, you know, of course, to pay the fighters, look, you can't do it right now. If it's against the law to have crowds, some states and in municipalities, I think it's like 250 people or more. Some it's 500 or more, whatever. And all of these, all this is up in the air. It's, it's changing almost by the minute, right? So, yeah, man, you can't sell tickets right now. So promoters, instead of pushing everything back to the second half of the year. Um, oh, okay, Gail, quick uh, interruption, guys. Gail in the chat says she just got an official MTK Global Top Rank Statement on Tyson Fury. Happy to read it on the show. Yes, Gail, that will be awesome. Please call in. Go ahead and uh, call the number here, and we'll patch you in, Gail. Um, but, yeah, man, so you guys are asking, what's an empty studio? 
Think about when they shoot sitcoms and stuff like that. They make it look like, like if it takes place in New York, like Seinfeld. Some of you guys probably don't even know what the hell Seinfeld is. Some of you younger guys. Seinfeld was a show that took place in New York. It was all filmed in Burbank, California. I think it was Burbank. Um, on a lot where they built a New York lot out there, right? It was basically shot in a studio and they made it look like it was in Manhattan or whatever, downtown. So that's where you're going to see some of these fights being held. And it, it's kind of, it's going to be odd because you're going to hear everything. You're going to hear every footstep, uh, people breathing. It's just going to be an odd thing. And there's going to be no crowd. But I, I imagine, of course, you'll have the ref. You'll have uh, judges, commission officials. I imagine you'll have a commentary crew there. But maybe the commentary guys will be remote from a studio in Los Angeles or New York. I, I don't know. It's going to be an interesting couple of months. But all this shit is fluid. I can't give you guys like any real answers as far as what's going to happen three to six months from now. We just don't know, man. I will say this. The events that are getting postponed and pushed back right now, it's not like they're just going to go away. They will eventually go back on the schedule. So what you're going to have is a bunch of fighters and platforms fighting for dates. There's only so many dates. I do think it it will probably mean that the summer, fall, and winter schedule will be pretty damn loaded. Because all these guys who aren't fighting right now in the spring, that's when they're going to fight. So I think it means we're going to get a loaded schedule but unfortunately, it could have an impact on some big fights coming together. Obviously, you guys know we're getting Wilder Fury, the third fight. That was supposed to happen in July. You really think it's going to happen in July still? I highly doubt it. That's going to get pushed way the hell back because that's a pay-per-view fight. It's in Vegas. I just talked about MGM Resorts being closed right now. There's huge, huge uh situations here just every decision affects the next 10 decisions right so it's a snowball rolling downhill harrison property with the super chat pledge thank you so much my man he asked what is happening with the billy joe saunders versus canelo fight announcement and date thanks mike all right the latest i've heard on that you guys correct me if i'm wrong i'm going to do a quick google search here um as far as I know, UK flights are, are they banned yet? Uh, I can't, guys, tell me, is there a travel ban? I know there's a travel ban on Europe. I don't know if there's a travel ban on the UK. I'm trying to look right now on, uh, on my Google here. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, okay. So here it is. Two days ago from the BBC. U.S. to extend travel ban to the U.K. and Ireland. So, Harrison Property, there you go, man. Unfortunately, because Canelo Alvarez delayed his uh, decisioning, and, and let me just put it out there, C Canelo is being a diva here. This is 100% on him. I don't put this on Saunders at all. He basically, the zone is trying to get him to do this multi-fight agreement where it's like, okay, you do Billy Joe Saunders in May, and then... In September, you fight Golovkin. And there's a sticking point with Canelo and the Golovkin fight. That's where the negotiations have stalled and broken down a little bit. So uh, right now, people from the UK can't come to America. And you guys know where uh, Billy Joe Saunders is from. So uh, that fight, I, I don't know if it's happening. As far as I'm concerned, you know, what do you do? If you're DAZN, if you're Canelo, you got to fight May 2nd. That is, if we're having fights, let's assume for a second that all these bans and everything end in April. As far as, you know, big events, sporting events, that all that ends in April. And starting in May, we can have sporting events. Well, I think it would be huge for Golden Boy and Canelo to have that fight right around Cinco de Mayo. I think it's May 2nd in Vegas. And it beat a big, the first big event since we had, you know, Fury and Wilder, Wilder there in February. So that'd be big for them. But if Billy Joe Saunders can't fly out here, I don't know, dude. I, I don't know what happens there. 
I would imagine if that fight's agreed to and signed that Saunders could still train over there in the UK and a week or two before the fight he could fly out here. But I totally understand why he might not want to do that. He might say, look, man, I want to get acclimated to the USA and be out there for three or four weeks. If there's a travel ban and he can't do that during the month of April, he might not be comfortable fighting in Vegas May 2nd. So it that that could really be blown up right now, man. Um, I just I just don't know. One quick super chat here from Carlos Cabrera. Thank you so much, Carlos. And then we're going to get to our special guest. Uh, Carlos says, this would be the perfect time for subscription-based platforms to make a push for more subscribers by showcasing fights in empty arenas, nowhere to go. Yeah, I agree, Carlos. And I think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see... Oh, you know what? Let me let me go down here. I think we're going to see that and then guys fighting in just empty studios. It might not be an arena. They might not fight like in MSG in an arena. It might be a controlled set, almost like the way a, a TV show or a film is done, where everything is controlled. Uh, and it's just they set up a ring where the officials can be and everything, and they fight there. It's going to be kind of odd But, hey, man, you you roll with the punches, to use a boxing expression there. Robert Blake in the chat says, Billy Joe Saunders is in the U.S. right now. You're completely right, Robert. I totally forgot about that. That's why I'm so glad I could do the show live now, so you guys can uh, keep me honest on that stuff. I believe that Billy Joe Saunders and Josh Taylor came to Vegas to train pretty recently. So... Thank you for correcting me on that because I think, um, look, if he's in the United States, there's no reason why we don't get Canelo Saunders May 2nd unless there's some sort of ban still on sporting events like that. So you know what? The NSAC, their commission meeting on the 25th of this month, uh, this month, March 25th, that's going to be a big meeting because – Whatever they decide there will have ramifications for all the Vegas fights. In a way, Casimiro, April 25th, and then Canelo Saunders, May 2nd. So if they decide after that meeting, hey, we're going to go forward and starting, let's say, April 20th, we can have events in Nevada. I think right after that, we should get an announcement officially, finally, for Canelo Saunders. Canelo is being a damn diva, though. All right, let's go to our special guest here. Let's go to the hotline. Miss Gail Falkenthal, how are you today? Montero, my brother. <laughs> we are practicing social distancing, everybody. That's right. We're, what, 2,500 miles apart? <laughs> That's, yeah. That, it's I think, working. It's working. It's working. I think the government will be happy with us. We, proper social distance I here. So. Thousands of miles apart. Uh, So, as I mentioned at the top of the show, Gail, you're a columnist for Communities Digital News, uh, public relations consultant. I know that you've done work for main events and other platforms in boxing and some work outside of boxing, obviously. Former broadcast journalist. uh, You teach at a a graduate class at a university there in San Diego. Could you just briefly talk a little bit about your experience in, in that world and specific to boxing? Well, I'll give you the 30-second history, yes. So I I am a native of San Diego. I grew up here, and I'm a third-generation native. My father, you know, like a lot of us, my dad was a massive boxing fan. And living in San Diego back in the day, uh, especially in in his childhood and young adulthood, uh, there was no such thing as cable TV. Ah, but we had more than three channels because we could watch all of Mexican television mm. out of Tijuana. And guess what was on all the time? All the great boxing. Not just the big stuff we saw on American TV, the great heavyweight fights of the 70s and 80s and, you know, all of that. But we were watching boxing from the Olympic Auditorium, boxing from Mexico City. We saw all the great Mexican fighters, a lot of the fights out of L.A. featuring Mexican talent. So I got hooked as a young woman on boxing. However, when I started my journalism career, ah, women sports writers, women sportscasters, (laughs) not a thing unless you wanted to cover maybe figure skating, maybe gymnastics. It didn't happen. 
So I, I commenced upon my journalism career, did my thing, worked a lot in radio, little in television, got out because I wanted to make some actual money, worked uh, in the public relations, public affairs area for several large organizations, and then finally started my own firm. And then out of a side door came an opportunity to do some journalism again, not sports, I might add, but then our sports editor couldn't make a fight. They were desperate to have someone go cover, and I raised my hand, and that poor dude never got his job back. So here (laughs) we are, well, 10, 12 years later. (laughs) And it was one of the early Pacquiao Marquez fights, and I don't remember which one to this this day. So it was in Vegas. Here we are. So you drove from San Diego to Vegas. Vegas. Okay. Exactly. In fact, that was the rub is the uh, news organization I work for, which is a general interest news site, which was originally the Washington Times newspapers website, um, which has since pulled away and is now independent, um, based in D.C. But here I was, you know, covering in San Diego and they needed someone proximate to Vegas. And I said, I can be there in five hours. And the editor, I admit, said, um, how much do you know about boxing? I said, listen, I promise I won't embarrass you. And what other options do you have? <laughs> so reluctantly, they said, OK, transferred the credential. I walk on in and think, you know, I like this shit. This is good. And I'm going to do such a good job. They never get rid of me. And the truth is, it made a lot more sense for me based out of Southern California to cover boxing because I could get to L.A. and get to Vegas in a heartbeat. And as you have said many times, Michael, on the show, you know, the the center of boxing in the United States is no longer on the East Coast. There are great fights on the East Coast. I love going to the garden when I get a chance. And I've been to a lot of venues in New Jersey, thanks to main event, but it really is Vegas and Southern California. Yeah, I, I just don't know how anyone could argue that anymore, but I still get in arguments with people on Twitter and stuff. Some of these guys from New York get so butthurt over it. I don't know why they're so insecure. <laughs> and it's a small group of you people, know, don't get me wrong. I there's an affection for it. I mean, I, yeah. I get that. Yeah. You know, we all love our favorite venues and sometimes the only reason is because there's an emotional connection. And one of the reasons I like boxing is that it is an emotional human driven sport. It isn't about a team. It isn't about colors or uniforms. It's about the men and the women in the ring. We see their faces. We know exactly what they're feeling second to second. And, that's and every one of them has a story to tell that's what to me makes it such a fascinating sport yeah i mean it's it's humanity live you you get every single chunk of humanity in a sporting event and you're up close for it there's no um corporate buffer the way you get in the nfl and major league baseball and all that stuff that's why boxing's so awesome i want to um jump to i don't want to make this a, a corona episode but you are there in san diego and uh because i mean the it's corona just, card the corona card i know there is just non-stop coverage of the coronavirus stuff if you turn on the tv you cannot avoid it so i don't want to go down that rabbit hole too much but you're in san diego where there are a lot of retirees california is a border state it is a coastal state so I don't think the situation there is anywhere near as bad as Los Angeles or or San Francisco, but I'm sure there are concerns there in San Diego. Can you just give everyone the latest updates? Like, are you guys on lockdown the way L.A. is? I know L.A. is shut down. We we are just shy of L.A.-style lockdown. And, of course, everything that California Governor Gavin Newsom has issued statewide applies to San Diego. Mm. We're in an interesting situation in that we were in on in on <laughs> this whole situation fairly early because one of the early uh, quarantine sites is the Marine Corps Air Station Miramar, which is I, I can't throw a rock quite that far, but it is just a couple miles from my house. I drive by it 
almost on a daily basis. So Miramar is currently housing, I believe, several hundred people from, you know, one of the cruise ships or airplanes or some damn thing sitting over there, you know, probably taking over the officer's housing on the base. And we've had people there from one of the Princess cruise ships. This has been going on for weeks here. So we're very, very acutely aware. And I would say also because of the enormous military presence in general in San Diego, which is also something, whether you're in the military or not, is an integrated fact of life for all of us. You know, we're fairly acutely aware of anything that goes on that has to do with national security issues. So, you know, we all know somebody involved. We're all very aware of what's going on, you know, whether you live right up on top of the base like I do or, or not. Um, and I just personally happen to have a, an elderly mother who is in assisted living with just about every one of those comorbidity factors you can name. And they're on absolute lockdown. Yeah. No, no leaving their room. Meals brought on a tray. She's bored as hell pissed that bingo got canceled damn it <laughs> oh man we're complaining about boxing being canceled but don't hold people oh from their God, bingo or they're gonna throw a fucking fit hey. oh tell me a hissy fit <laughs> and today the worst blow of all her goddamn soap opera was canceled <laughs> oh shit <laughs> probably one you've appeared on montero i, I have been on a couple of them yeah it's uh, it's been a while <laughs> You know, I was actually uh, talking to a few people out here. Atlanta, I guess, has a pretty good television scene. I didn't really realize that. But there's a few people saying, you know, maybe I can get plugged in to some of the shows out here. We'll we'll see what happens. But that would be pretty cool. You know, cool. the Steve Harvey Empire and the Tyler Perry Empire, I believe, are both based out there in Atlanta, aren't they? And yeah. There's and an I've, enormous Made in Georgia film commission. Yeah. So Georgia is as boy. big as New York now, basically, with the amount of yeah. film work out here. So I've done one of Tyler Perry's shows already. Uh, that was a while ago, though. Okay. Let, I want to talk about something with you is in regards to – media relations and boxing. And if you can't talk too much about it, I understand. But it seems to me that so many promoters have such terrible media relations, PR, and they handle situations so poorly. One one that just jumps to my head right now is Canelo, when he got the title off Cotto, dumped it because he didn't want to fight Golovkin. Then they went into this whole thing for a year, year and a half, two years. Then they finally fight, blah, blah, blah. The PR fallout for Canelo was so bad with that. And you'd figure somebody at Golden Boy Promotions, who, by the way, owns Ring Magazine, who I write for. Okay, everyone, full disclosure. So hopefully I don't get in trouble, but I'm going to just put it out there. You'd figure somebody at Golden Boy would hire somebody like you that knows about this stuff and it can get ahead of a situation like that and say, guys, let's plan a couple steps ahead and watch the way that we talk about this publicly because there's going to be some backlash on social media. It seems to me some promoters get that, some don't. Why is there an issue, you think, with, or am I just exaggerating this stuff? What's your opinion on that? Well, part of the problem with dealing with a sport like boxing is it is, got so many moving parts and so many different audiences and so many different players. You know, a promoter is not like an NFL team. It's not an owner with employees. Football players are essentially employees. Basketball players are essentially employees. Boxers are not employees. Hmm. Boxers are independent contractors. And so they have contracts written, you know, as if you hire somebody to, you know, come do a job for you fixing your house or, you know, any other independent contractor, you're, you know, they are not paying a boxer's taxes and unemployment insurance. It is a business to business arrangement. So when you work doing media relations for the promoter, You are not the media relations person for the fighter. They may, and many do, hire their own independent 
public relations representatives. So now you've got somebody representing the promoter, somebody representing the fighter, somebody else may be interested in an interested party representing, say, the venue, MGM Grand, MGM Properties. Uh, then you've got the people representing the sanctioning organizations. Mm-hmm. And now you've got one big, let me be politically incorrect, Chinese fire drill going on <laughs> with everybody serving their own interests. Right. So sometimes it's a tug of war. Sometimes, it, you know, it's a flat out mixed martial arts battle with multiple players. Sometimes the public relations professionals can get on board together and sometimes not. And it can almost be a situation where it's as if you're dealing with a plaintiff's attorney and a defense attorney and their colleagues, they understand each other's business, but they represent very different sides of the same equation. So you have Canelo who uh, is, you know, essentially his own business right. as an individual um, with his own interests. And I'm sure he is getting good advice on the other side. Oscar De La Hoya and the parties at Golden Boy have their in-house team who frankly are very good and among the better public relations folks in the business and have some counsel by an outside firm in Los Angeles getting advice from their own perspective. Sometimes they can find a meeting of the minds. Sometimes they can't. And some, it depends on who gets the story out first whose interests prevail, how nice do they want to play with each other. And we were just talking about the fact that this is a very human, emotional sport. Emotions do run high. There's so much on the line. You know, there's so much money on the line. There's so much personally on the line, you know, and they butt heads. And then we get to watch it all play out. Well, I just from a from a PR perspective, and again, I don't, you know, we won't go too far down this rabbit hole either. But I look back, and I get accused of being a triple G homer. Okay, fine, but you go back what five years ago, and I wanted to bring up triple G because Gail, you were along for that ride as well as as myself, Tiffany, and everybody in the greater Los Angeles, Southern California fight scene. We saw this guy when you went to his first couple pressers. Barely spoke English. There were maybe a dozen people there. Nobody knew who the hell he was outside of the most hardcore of the hardcore boxing nerd who had heard about him from the amateurs. And Bernie Bermasel worked with Tom Loeffler. It was K2 Promotions at the time. And, of course, Gennady, Abel Sanchez, HBO. So there's a PR guy, right? Correct me if I'm wrong on this. But they had... A message, they had branding, they knew what they were going to do with this guy, how to do it. And for a few years, he fights three or four times a year, no casinos, none of the casino money, going to real venues, started small. I, I'm, him, him against uh, Rubio at StubHub, it was StubHub at the time, that set a record for StubHub, which I think was like eight, 9,000. So that tells you the crowd. Oh, they almost get... got 10,000 folks in there that okay. night. Remember, they put bleachers up at the top. Was that Rubio? Uh, okay, okay. So, that so, was Marco Antonio Rubio fight, yeah. So that just tells you, like, they weren't going for, they weren't putting him in 20,000-seat venues too soon, which you see often with these other promoters because they have, you know, side deals with some of these management companies that own several venues. But they, it just seemed that they had this really good, PR machine and plan in the way they did this over three, four years, built Gennady up. He ends up getting these fights with Canelo, regardless of how you feel, win, lose, draw, regardless of how you feel about Golovkin kind of turning into a diva himself in the last couple of years. His, that PR machine worked so well. Why don't we see other platforms and other fighters try to follow that and do the same thing? Well, in that case, this is a good case study you've brought up. Perfect example. Bernie Barmacel was an, a contractor hired by Tom Loeffler in K2. So he worked for the promoter and 
Golovkin put himself in their hands for his rollout. But, you know, as you start, as these younger guys or less experienced guys, and certainly somebody like Golovkin coming to the United States who had to rely on other people to translate and work his way through the American boxing scene, needed to rely on some other folks. As they become more independent and a little more willing to speak their own mind, have their own ideas, want to take a little more control of the reins, you'll notice that he he hired his own publicist. Another very good one, frankly, mm-hmm. Fred Sternberg, who's excellent, um, who's also worked for many years for Manny Pacquiao. Right. And so suddenly you've got the promoter's representative and the fighter's representative, and they have different visions of what they want to see happen. And it it happens. And, you know, Michael, somebody like me happens all the time, both with boxing and with clients in other industries. We, we are a lot like attorneys. Our job is to render the best possible advice to our clients, and they are free to ignore it, and they frequently do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just I feel like that's such a great case study. And maybe it was a perfect storm and everything else, and maybe the Golovkin thing wouldn't have worked out if he relocated to New York or Chicago or somewhere else. Maybe – Southern California was the perfect place. But I just, for the life of me, I can't understand why other promoters haven't looked at the way that worked and said, holy shit. Because it's not like he was a prospect. This is a guy who was, I think, at least 30 when he came to America. I don't remember off the top of my head. And he was experienced. Well, right. He, they well, weren't taking a guy to... from the Olympics and doing this. Right. And let's remember, you had a mature athlete when Golovkin came to the United States, you know, he wasn't 20 or 22 and that's a big difference. You know, he had a family, he had a very clear idea about his skill set and what he had to offer. He came here with a very specific path in mind because as we know his history, you know, he'd really gotten screwed over in Germany and he had to find another way and he was willing to do whatever it took including a lot of the publicity in the persona assigned to him, a role he happily played, eventually didn't fit too well anymore. And it really is a lot like a young actor or even a child actor, you know, who has people creating, you know, a public face, a personality, and they grow out of it. And Golovkin did grow out of that happy warrior, uh, Mexican style, my friends respect box. You know, he started getting tired of it, frankly. Yeah, you can tell. I'll recommend in a shameless plug, an interview I did. In fact, you were present at this luncheon for Golovkin. And I came in late due to traffic. Dang it. But it's the best thing ever happened to me because Golovkin recognizes me. One asset of being a redheaded woman in boxing is you kind of stand out. They remember you. He knows I'm a friendly face. He approached me um, with his translator, Sergey, who I know fairly well. And I asked him, how are you doing? You know, and I, I think it was the tone in my voice. And I will say, as a woman sports writer, frequently they're much more comfortable with me. You know, they don't have to display quite the same sort of machismo thing and I can, in an, in, you know, express in my voice, how you doing, Gennady? How mm-hmm. are you? How are you? And suddenly the truth comes pouring out. And as I realized what he's starting to say, I stopped him and turned to him and Sergey and said, Sergey, I want to make sure before we go further that he understands whether or not this is supposed to be on the record. That is a staple of being professionally trained as a journalist to ask, are you on the record or not? Absolutely. You you have to establish that ahead. You can't say that after the fact. A trained journalist will say to you, you know, horse is out of the barn. They will stop you and say, are you on the record or not? And he said, I absolutely am. The recorder goes on. And what emerged was a guy who's just 
plain worn out by the game of boxing, by the business side of things. He just wants to fight. He just wants to be an athlete, but they got to manage their career. They've got to get involved. If they're smart and want things to go the way they want, they have to get involved in the business side of things. They don't want to trust managers anymore. And Golovkin has had to enter into lawsuits with previous management. So he's wary. He is wary. He wants to handle his own business affairs. You know, and that shit will wear you out when you just want to go in the gym and hit something and go into the ring and hit somebody. And he's tired. You know, he's closing in on 40. No, he's you can tired. the last the the difference between the first Canelo fight and the second Canelo fight, um, it was apparent. And I've I'm pretty good friends with Abel Sanchez, his wife, his son Leonard, and his wife Beverly. And you know, I can't really a lot of it was off the record, but some of the things I was told, you know, they could see him kind of just wearing down mentally in a way or emotionally where he was just kind of tired of the bullshit. And when I saw him out there at Santa Monica, that meeting you're talking about, um, he did seem happier. He seemed a little lighter, a little happier, but he's very guarded, very, very guarded. And he really only opens up around people that know him or I'm sorry, that he knows. Um, So yeah, I think you being there and others of us that were there, some familiar faces that were there when he was kind of starting his run, I think that made him maybe open up a little bit and feel more comfortable. I I think so. And yeah, they just, boxing is so much a mental game as well. Fights absolutely are won and lost in the mind first, long before you step into that ring. And when you're worn out, when you've got distractions, mental or emotional distractions, you've got any, any part of that brain firing off on anything related to other than your fight game, your fight approach, and how you're going to perform physically, you're at a disadvantage. You're at a disadvantage. And, you know, he's going to call it a career fairly soon. And, hey, mm-hmm. nobody needs to wipe their tears for him He's going to retire a pretty rich man. I think he'll build a nice promotional business in Kazakhstan and Eastern Europe. He already is. He is there a lot more. He's doing business there. You know, he'll be fine. He'll be just fine. But it is a shame for those of us at fans who have seen him at his best to not see him go out at his best. And that's true of any of these guys. We want to see them go out at their best. And so few do it. So few pull an Andre Ward and retire right when they should, or even a little short of when they should. Lennox Lewis. You know, we can count those guys on one hand. Oh, yeah. Do that. Yeah. That's very true. And I, I have respect for a guy like Andre Ward who hints comebacks. You know, but he he left at the right time. Even Vladimir Klitschko, he could come back tomorrow and get $30 million if he wanted to fight uh, one of these top guys, do a rematch with Fury or something. He walked away and stayed away. It's not just walking away, it's staying away. And part of that, too, is you give the younger guys a chance to shine. You know, Floyd needs to stay away. Just stay away, dude. And even uh, I, I would say Manny Boy, needs to retire, oh, but Manny here's the siren call, man. Yeah, <laughs> Manny just beat Keith Thurman last year, so Manny can keep going. But I want to before I let you go, I want to just hint uh, or hit on women's boxing real quick. Um, you talked about being, and not just women in the ring, but women in media, because it seems to me someone like you that's been around in in the public relations world, the journalism world, as a woman covering boxing 10 years ago, what have you seen change? Because it seems to me overnight that a bunch of women have hit the boxing media. And a lot of them are just doing the fighter interviews and stuff. But there's a few women who do what I I would consider real hard-hitting journalism. They're writing articles. They're analyzing fights. They're breaking things down. They have real historical knowledge. You can tell they know their shit. I've been saying for years, 
you should have got some of the network jobs we've seen some of these women get in recent times. I really think you'd be much better suited for it because you know your shit. But just from a female's point of view, could you talk a little bit about that? Just the changes you've seen. I firmly believe these are the changes that are happening in a lot of industries that women are making more inroads. I don't think boxing is particularly unique in that regard, um, but it is a very male dominated profession, you know, by its nature. Um, So like anybody trying to wedge their foot in the door who doesn't quite fit the mold, you've got to be just a little better at it, work just a little harder at it. And you know what? I'm confident in what I can do. So I have no problem with that. I'm perfectly okay with that. Talk to me, read my stuff. I can't be stupid. I can't get a fact wrong. I do get jumped on. I do get a few, you know, choice words from time to time. But I will say this, for the most part, I have been more than accepted, welcomed, embraced, never felt barely a whiff of sexism and absolutely no racism, no real misogyny. And I think it's mainly because of the way I deal with people, the way I carry myself, uh, dare I say it, the way I choose to act and appear professional. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm not Jenny Sushi, let's just put it that way. <laughs> and, you know, if you're there to play, you're there to be on camera, and it's exactly. more about you than them, I take, take that with a grain of salt, ladies and gentlemen. We as journalists, trained journalists, and, and that's an advantage I have over a lot of folks getting in the game, who I like, like them as people, love a lot of what they do, but a lot of the folks, whose objective is getting clicks on YouTube to make a living aren't journalists. I have the luxury of I agree. worrying a little less about that and worrying a little less about it being about me. In journalism, as a writer, it should absolutely never, ever be about you. You don't see me. You don't see me in photos. You don't see me in video. I want the camera trained on the person that I want you to learn about. And yeah, through the prism of my experience with them, my perception, what I'm hearing, what I'm processing, the body language, and endeavoring to ask them questions that bring something new to you. My goal for every single fighter I interview is to hear one of two things. One is, oh, gosh, I've never been asked that before. Yeah. And they've got to pause and think about what to say. The other is, that's a great question. And when I hear Andre Ward say to me, that is a great question, or Floyd, or Jose Ramirez say, that's a great question. Dang it. I've succeeded for the people I'm writing for. That's my 100% goal. And I will say, I do think in many ways, coming from a Female perspective, I've got a perception that's a little different, a little more human, if you will. Um, now, don't get me wrong, everybody. I love seeing two guys smash it up. <laughs> I, I like a, I love me a good body shot knockout. Let me tell you, my favorite thing in the world. But I appreciate what it takes to get there, and it is. It, there's a lot of fortitude that goes into this and hours and hours of work and anguish and hard days and breakdowns. Um, when you see a guy win who perhaps didn't expect to hear that announcer call his name or he hears the three most magical words to him in the English language and the new mm-hmm. and they break down that's my favorite moment in boxing. My absolute favorite moment. One of my favorite moments of all. And I, Michael, you might have been there that night. I don't recall. Kel Brook beating Sean Porter yep. was so emotional. His fans in the audience were so emotional. It was a lovely moment. Everything he'd worked for. 
came together in that one moment, that pregnant pause, that just a few seconds extra drama pause from Jimmy Lennon Jr. in the silence at, I'd still call it, to StubHub Center before he said, yeah, I'll always and call it the that. new brilliant moment. Brilliant moment. Yeah, that's and, what we, and we, get to be, we all live for. We get to be right next to that. And we get to uh, be in the gyms and see just a, a fraction, a tiny fraction of what these guys put themselves through. The beatings they're taking and sparring, you know, the weeks leading up to a fight, uh, the beatings they're putting on their body, I should say, training and all that. And then you see that the moment. The deprivation of being on a diet. That, yeah. Not going and out. For you know, anyone who's ever everybody. trained to any degree, you just have a somewhat of an idea of what that is. Uh, and then you see oh, it sucks. that you see <laughs> yeah. you see that sucks. moment where they, they finally broke through and their family's there, their fans are there. And for a guy like you mentioned, Kel Brook, when he when he beat Porter there at StubHub, you could tell there were fans there in the house that had made the flight. They had traveled thousands of miles and were close to this guy. And to see all that humanity playing out in front of you, it's like, damn, all right, I get paid like shit. But I have a pretty cool job. Gail, awesome stuff. Yeah. Um, let me, uh, before I let you go, please let everybody know where they can find you on social media. I am uh, both on Twitter and Instagram at PR Pro San Diego. Yeah, I bagged it. Uh, you'll see my little avatar. I am holding an honest to God super champion WBC green <laughs> belt. Which at the time belonged to um, uh, Bra- from Vargas, Francisco Vargas. <laughs> really? That was, wow, <laughs> okay. To me okay. And I got a shot of it, right? I think every um, boxing writer yeah. has that picture. <laughs> every boxing writer I has think, that. I think they do. You know, they'll hand it over to you. Goddamn, those things are heavy, too. I'll tell they you are what. heavy. Um, you know, and there's a lot going on. Michael, before I let you go, have you seen the joint statement from Queensbury Top Rank and MPK Global regarding one Tyson Fury no, in the go, last few minutes? Go ahead and break that down for us before we move on. Let me read it, and you can discuss among yourselves. Breaking news, ladies and go. gentlemen. Breaking news. Due to the publication of a number of misleading and misrepresentative statements and articles made by third parties relating to Tyson Fury, the following statement is made jointly by MTK Global, Top Rank, and Queensberry Promotions. Tyson Fury is the globally recognized number one heavyweight in the world and the current lineal <clears throat> WBC and Ring Magazine champion. Tyson is contracted to a third fight with former WBC world champion Deontay Wilder. Any statement made regarding negotiations, talks, venues, or any other bout should be disregarded. Top Rank, MTK Global, and Queensberry Promotions have and will continue to work in close conjunction with each other to deliver Tyson Fury the best opportunities to enhance his careers and earnings. This will require each party, as well as Tyson Fury himself, to continue to work together as a team to explore and negotiate any and all future possibilities. The collaboration has thus far seen Tyson Fury enter into one of the most lucrative contracts in boxing history become a global phenomenon, and reclaim his rightful position atop the heavyweight division. Any updates regarding future fights will only be made through official channels, and we will continue to deliver boxing fans the biggest and best fights involving the Gypsy King. Many options have presented themselves in the Middle East for such bouts. Any meetings regarding the subject will be held in Dubai with all the necessary parties. Very interesting, and nothing regarding various rumors about meat products. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And Media relations. All right, we'll close it all with that. <laughs> Gail, thank you so much. Great stuff. I'll thank let you, you go. Michael. Look forward to appearing with you at another time again. And and until then, uh, fighting goes on in Tijuana, folks. So you want to, you know, drive the bus down with me? Yeah. Give me a call. Let me know. There you go. All right, Gail. Have a good one. Have a good one, everybody. Ciao. All right. Gail Falkenthal, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, real quick, 
A quick couple news items, and then we'll go to the phones here. Uh, just real, real quick. I talked about the canceled fights, postponed fights, etc. Look, right now, um, we're kind of desperate for content, guys. So any ideas that you have for me to do videos here on my channel or discussions like I had last Friday with Kenny and Vince of the Boxing Rant, uh, if you'd like to see any particular subject covered, Remember, it can also be with somebody that I disagree with on a particular subject. I'm not going to talk to a whack job that's doing some of the dishonest clickbait bullshit, but someone who has a genuine, or genuine disagreement with me. Let's say somebody out there honestly feels Canelo Alvarez beat Gennady Golovkin in their first fight. And you guys trust this person, respect them. They're coming from a place of logic and reason and facts. Okay, I'll debate that person right here on the show. You know, we need that kind of content right now because we just, there's not a whole lot of fights going on. Although, as Gail says, it's still uh, all business going forward in Tijuana. But outside of there, uh, you look, right now there's not a whole lot going on. So any ideas you guys have for content, let me know. Also, uh, Helenius Kavnatsky, Kavnatsky, I think it's Kavnatsky peaked at about 1.7 million viewers on Fox. That's a pretty decent rating to see that fight. And Usyk Shisora is official for May 23rd in London at the O2. As far as I know, that is still going forward. They're going forward with ticket sales, promotion, all that stuff. So I do believe that they're they're thinking over there, Eddie Hearn, Matchroom, DAZN, everyone involved is thinking by that time, all this Corona scare stuff should have died down a little bit. They're going, like, full systems ahead for that fight May 23rd in London. Okay, I think this is Aaron here on the line. Let me jump over to the phone lines real quick. Uh, 447, you're on TNC. Is this Aaron? Yeah, it is Aaron, yeah. What's up, man? How you doing? Yeah, all good. Thank you. What you got for the show? So, uh, it's funny you mentioned video ideas, actually. Um, I don't know how, how you can go into this, but looking at the the next this decade of boxing sort of how do you see it playing out um how does zone might rise the death of pay-per-view things like that uh, bob aaron's sort of successor i thought that'd be an interesting video idea for the, for the next 10 years of play so like the 2020s what what to expect i like that yeah. idea health of fires and the sort of um recent events might change the way we look at that and different ruling with that I, I remember watching your video at the end of last year after um hello yeah we're here oh, I, think I, cut, I think i cut out there um oh okay yeah you cut out for a second you were talking about yeah, uh, a video that you liked from last year fires. yeah and you were talking about check ways sort of throughout the year for fires at different weights and how you think that might come into fruition in the next few years? Do you think that's something that's going to be viable or? Check weights? I remember you saying that to check uh, fighters weigh in. So oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Straight after weighing, things like that. Yeah, okay. So like weight checks. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I wrote about that in a piece for, for, uh, for the Ring Mag. Um, yeah. I definitely think that's like, I like the idea of monthly weight checks. And I actually talked to... Mm -hmm. Andy Foster, the head of the California Commission, a couple months back. And he promised me he was going to put that on the commission's agenda for their next meeting because he loved the idea so much. So uh, we'll see. But, yeah, that's definitely something I think we need to do because it's the weight drain that's killing boxers right now. The, yeah, the yeah. science that we have shows it's, it's that more than anything. And a lot of the performance-enhancing drugs are related to cutting weight. Yeah, I'd say the the only other question was, I know uh, quite a while ago there was talk of Dana White entering boxing. Uh, have you heard anything about that or any progression with that? It's the same old shit, man. Dana, Dana White loves to, I don't want to beat up on Dana White, but it just seems to me that he likes to kind of use boxing as a way to promote his product. Whenever boxing gets something wrong, he's like, ah, see what they're doing over here? We don't do this over here. See what they're doing over there? We don't do that. So, uh, but he's talked about the Zufa promotions for ages. I thought for a while maybe him and Floyd Mayweather were going to do something together. Him, Floyd, and Connor maybe work together. I don't know. 
I haven't heard a damn thing. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just don't know. But if, you know, look, if he does have some clout um, to where I think if he really did get involved in a big way and he surrounded himself with boxing people, knowledgeable boxing people who have been in the boxing industry for decades, I think he'd have a really good chance just because of his brand recognition and everything. But if he thinks he's going to come in and like reinvent the wheel, not happening. It just doesn't work yeah. like that in this sport. Others have tried to do that and they've crashed and burned and he would be no different. That's, that's, that's all I've got. I mean, the last, last week seemed brilliant with two videos. I wish we could go back to that system again. I love that two bi-weekly content, but yeah, it's, it's been great content the last few weeks, Mike. So, I yeah, appreciate I'll, it, Aaron. I'll and we might go back to that at some point. It's just right now, I got to scale it back and do once a week. I got too many other things yeah. going on. But at some point, we might we might do that, brother. But I appreciate it, man. Have a good selfish. night. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers. All right, guys. So I guess I should do a quick review. Uh, there was some fights last week uh, from Hinkley, Minnesota, from Salida Promotions. There's a showbox card. And uh, undefeated welterweight prospect Brandon Lee scores a TKO3 win to improve to 19 0, 17 knockouts. That was his first 10 rounder. He is 5'10, 20 years old, out of SoCal, the boxing hotbed of Southern California. Pretty good looking prospect. Really wasn't pushed or challenged in this fight, but considering all the crazy circumstances, I think that it was uh, a pretty good overall performance from him. Uh, so preview, this week, not a whole lot going on, man. Uh, let's see, Friday, March 20th, the Golden Contract Light Heavyweight Tournament from London. Uh, I think that's going to be on ESPN+. Plus. That was picked up from over there. Not the best card in the world, but it is what it is. It's something, as far as I know, that's still going forward. And then next Saturday, March 28th, the fight between Artur Beturbiev and Meng Fanlong. And, of course, that will be for the WBC and IBF light heavyweight titles that Beturbiev holds. Apparently, that's still on for ESPN. It was going to be in Quebec City. I don't know if they're changing venues or what. But as far as I know, that's still going down. So they might change venues on that one. But the latest I heard this morning, and I asked the people involved, it's still going down. So hopefully it stays that way because, whew, nothing on TV right now. No action. Uh, and then as of now, there are cards from Germany, London, and Vegas still on the schedule for next weekend as well. All pretty much club-level shows. They're stay-busy kind of fights. Nothing big. But if we get to see Artur Beterbiev on regular ESPN next Saturday, cool. Sign me up for that because uh, he's one of the beasts right now in the sport. He's a monster. So, guys, I, that's it, man. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Gail. I'm telling you right now, that woman knows her stuff. She's classy. And it was really, really great working with her in the SoCal fight scene uh, for years I saw a few of you guys commenting, man, why did Mike leave Los Angeles and move to Atlanta? I moved here because I needed to buy a house. I got engaged. I'm getting married later this year. I want to buy a house. And you just can't do that in Los Angeles unless you're a millionaire. And if you look at the state of affairs in L.A. right now, not the best place to live. Now, San Diego? I don't know. Maybe at some point, uh, maybe we'll go back to California. And if we were to do that... Tiffany, my fiance, she is a native of San Diego, and that would be a place maybe we target. And that way we'd still be close to L.A., close enough to Las Vegas. So perhaps um, we will do that in the future. But for right now, we made the decision to come out here to the east where we could buy a mansion for next to nothing and start our life together at the same time, I was able to build this studio, guys. This show that I'm doing, all the technology. You can't see all these wires and shit around me, these monitors and mixing boards. I was able to do all this because I left California. If I was still in California, I could not afford any of this. So the fact that I was able to buy a house, build a studio with my bare hands. I literally built this studio myself. Get this equipment set up where I can build 
my own brand here. I can do my own show. That is my goal. No one's going to give me a job in the business. No one's going to say, oh, hey, Mike, here, I'm going to punch you in the head with the job. I'm going to have to build my own thing to the point where they can't ignore me anymore. I couldn't do that in L.A. So that's why I made that move. But at some point, perhaps I will wind up back in Cali because I loved it there. Oh, we got a buzzkill. More breaking news from Miss Gail Falkenthal. She just said, Mike, the Turbia fight is canceled. Baturbia versus Fon Long, March 28th. Progre versus Hooker, April 17th. And Benavidez versus Angulo, April 18th, are all off. Damn. I knew about Progre Hooker. I knew about Benavidez Angulo. But literally, as of this morning, I was asking people in a Baturbia fight. Apparently was on. They were just looking for a different venue. Gail just said it, though. That one is done. So, guys, we don't have shit to watch for the next few weeks. So, again, give me some ideas of who you'd like to see me chat with. Who would you like to have on the show as a guest? I'll start getting the wheels in motion to make that stuff happen so we have some stuff to talk about and discuss. Gail says, Mike, we should both move to Las Vegas. Henderson, that's a suburb there, is damn nice. Gail, you know what? That's another one I've thought about. Henderson is pretty nice. I actually know a couple people that moved there. Vegas, though, man, those summers, I just don't know, man. These summers here in Atlanta suck. Vegas in the summertime, whew. Holy shit, I don't know. But we have thought about that too. Who knows? You never know what the future holds, guys. As far as I'm concerned, it could all change. Who knows? Maybe the phone does ring a year or two from now and I'm offered a job in Las Vegas and I'm out there. It could happen. All right, you know what? We got one more call here. Let's just jump to this last call and then we'll wrap up the show, guys. Uh, Let's see, 353, you're on the neutral corner. Go. Hello, how are you today, Mike? I'm good. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. This is Mark from Ireland. I thought so. What's up, Mark? Yeah. Um, not a lot. I'm I'm just a little bit down because of everything that's been going on. You know, everything's in lockdown and crap, especially here in Ireland. And um, all the schools are cancelled. I mean, Ireland might be the only place you can get groceries, though. I was able to walk into a store and there was no one there. There, they were so afraid. Jesus. Honest. Yeah, we, we, Tiffany and I yeah. went to the supermarket yesterday, and there was nothing there. And I'm, it was funny. In, in, like, the produce section, the meat was gone, all that. But, like, broccoli, all the broccoli was there. So, you know, Americans, they're going in, and they're buying up. Like, beer was gone. <laughs> meat was gone. But broccoli's there. Kale is there. And I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, America, get it together. But anyway, vegetarian so, times. The vegetarians are loving it right now. Yeah, exactly. They are loving it right now. Um, you know, I'm not sure if the Avenetian fight versus Kelly is cancelled yet. I haven't heard word on that. I don't so, know. I don't know. I have not checked all my I would emails today. Get an, oh, I'm sorry about all the text I'd probably messages, get a guys. notification. I'd probably get a notification because I applied for media credentials for that fight, you know? And I was accepted for them, but... Haven't said that, I haven't heard anything that the fight is yet cancelled. Which kind of sucks because I'd like to know so that I don't book to go over. And I may not because it might get cancelled with two, three days notice or it might be closed off. So, you never know. Um, other than that, everything seems to be going the way of the dodo board. Um, Breedis and Dorticos is apparently cancelled as well, which is sad. They pushed back the date. It's on for May 16. It's for now. Yeah, for now, for now. I mean, who knows what's my my gut feel, Mark, is that March is fucked. Most of April's fucked, but by May and June, we're going to start to get back on track. That's my gut feel. I think my gut feeling is a little bit different, and I know nobody likes the negative Nancy around, but my gut feel is we may not have any public event fights until maybe October, <laughs> Um just based on the way the numbers are producing and going up, they're not actually coming down. They're spreading more and more. And in different countries and different states, the numbers are going up each day. And if we get to a stage by April that those numbers are still continuing, by the time they start to decline, 
they're probably not going to allow it and everything's going to be on lockdown until at least June. Yeah, I look, we I think it's very likely we'll have a situation where fights start to go forward May, June, July, but they're studio fights. They're they're in a controlled environment as I said before. Maybe that's going to be like the happy medium. And maybe we're not going to get the big Vegas fights and all that until the fall. I could very much see that happening. But these guys have to make money. Fighters don't get paid if they don't fight. So even if they're fighting in a studio where, again, there's just a makeshift ring, uh, commission officials, the referee and whatnot, and even the announcers are – And a green screen. You could very well see that. And a remote commentary team – you know, conferencing in from a studio somewhere, I think you could see that. But as far as fights being canceled, I just think by May they're going to have to put some fights on, even if it's in a studio yeah. environment. They can't push it back till October. These guys have to feed their families. You know what I'm saying? I know. I know. But this year was looking like one of the best years for boxing. I you know. know. The fights that the schedule was so beautiful. Even down to fights that people weren't really talking about, like lower tier fights like Jamal James and Delorme, all going all the way up to the top of the new A Casimiro, uh Ubali versus Denair. Uh, oh, yeah, like dude. going up to Fimo and Loma, like unifications, unifications. Yes. We were looking at we could have been on the precipice. And it, maybe this was me looking too hopeful of three different undisputed world champions in in this year. Like if Fury Joshua could have been made for December, and that's that's a different situation now with the farmer. But if that had been made for December, and uh, the winner of Ubali Denair fought the winner of Casemiro in Newway, and then Taylor and Ramirez fought in November, we could have genuine. We could ha- still have three undisputed champions, but it's looking less likely now. We probably won't get way less likely. We probably won't get any of them. The the one that's the closest is at one forty, but I definitely think we were going to get two of those by the end of this year before all this happened. Yeah, man, like the spring schedule was great, and it was going to lead to these unification fights at the end of the year. It's like the economy was doing really, really well. The stock market, the boxing schedule, everything was off to a great start, and then. The universe just shit on it, and we had to get this coronavirus outbreak. It sucks. And there's people politicizing it, of course, weaponizing it. It's nothing but polar extremes on social media. Jesus Christ, nobody can be objective anymore. Ugh, yeah. Mark, it just drives me it's, nuts. It's too much to one side, by the way. Like It's either people are like, oh, we're all going to die, or oh, it's just the flu. Like, exactly. You need to be somewhere in the middle on this. You exactly. really do. I'm somewhere in the middle. Like, I'm going out myself, but, like, I also know that I need to be slightly cautious. I do. There are people dying from this. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's it like I said at the joke. top of the show. Use cautious concern. Be responsible. But there are people right now that can't stay at home. Some of you guys, again, watching this, you have to go out and work. Or you're not going to make money. We don't all get a salary. For me, I can sit at home and I can type up boxing articles from my home and I can get those out and I can get paid. I'm lucky. There's a lot of people out there. I was talking to a guy last week who does custom garage doors. I have a carport in my house and I'm converting my carport to a garage. And he helped me install a garage door. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, man. I'm working my ass off on this house. But he was just telling me, he's like, dude, my kids are at home from school, so I got to be home for my kids. He's a single father. I can't put him in daycare. But at the same time, I got to go to service calls. If I don't, I don't get paid. I can't feed my kids. So he's having to take his little kids with him on service calls. He has no other option. I'm just like, so all the people saying, oh, you're a horrible person if you leave your house. They're saying that from their ivory tower. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, some people have to leave the house. But, yeah, anyway, we can rant about that for hours, Mark. I'll give you the last word, man, and then I'll let you go. Yeah, um, in terms of like these, go, I'll give you everybody what I'm doing. If you, want, if you need a fix for boxing, go and watch a lot of old school fights. There's some beauties out there. Go to the Ring Magazine Fights of the Year. Or not, if you haven't seen them, I just watched Bobby Chacon versus Raphael and non-4. Great <laughs> so 
Go Super back, enough. watch some fights, enjoy the sport for what it was, and yeah, wash your hands. Wash your ass. <laughs> wash your ass. Safe. Yeah. All right, Mark. Safe, Thanks safe. a lot, and man. Thank you. Have a good Peace, night, man. brother. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up there, man. Um, yeah, as Mark says, wash your ass. Wash your ass before you wash your mouth. Or wait, <laughs> wash your mouth before you wash. Just wash, okay? Don't touch your damn eyes or your face. And just use caution. That's all. It's it's simple, guys. All right. I'll see you at the fights. Let me know some ideas, okay, for future stuff that you want to see. And um, we'll get through this, guys. It's going to be okay. By year's end, this will all be cleared up, all right? It's just going to be crazy for a little while. But we've gotten through crazier shit. We'll get through this one. I love you guys. See you at the fights.